So, uh, hello everybody, thanks for coming in for my talk about uh, a smooth introduction to SQL. Um, let me maybe introduce myself and uh, our company. So, I'm Joel Falcou, I'm an associate professor at the, uh, well, the computer science lab of uh, Orsay, which is near Paris. I won't uh, butcher the uh, very French acronym. <laughs> so, <coughs> my research topics and uh, general interest is basically doing parallel computing and doing that in C++ with proper uh, interface, proper abstraction. And to do so, I usually try to uh, torture compilers um, for various reasons because, well, you know. So <laughs> I've been authoring and commenting a bunch of C++ library uh, on various subjects, including CMD programming, um, and other stuff. And I'm also a co-founder at CodeRecon, which is a company centered on uh, giving um, ERPs trainings uh, on C++ and HPC in general in various ways. And we try to integrate whatever we do and whatever we, we need to be doing in the company into various uh, open source projects. So that's for myself. Uh, what are we are going to speak about today? Well, uh, we are going to speak about a bunch of tools to deal with this, you know, very recurring subject about the fact that, you know, computers, you have more of them every year. You are, they are more complex every time you look at them, you know. Uh, more cores, more heterogeneous systems, stuff like that. And uh, it's very cool and dandy because it makes, you know, like um, GPU vendors or CPU vendors to do uh, cool keynotes with fine benchmarks and curves that go up. But uh, the issue with that is that at some point, uh, someone somewhere has to write code for these machines. And before one, it was basically a matter of juggling with a bunch of threads in, in your head or having to think about how to vectorize a bunch of codes or doing both at the same time. Um, well, it's not going to be easier and easier because now we have like thousands of cores in GPUs. You have heterogeneous systems. You have reconfigurable systems that starts to be um, a major uh, player in a, in, a, in a bunch of fields. So uh, it's not going to be easier for, for the random Joe developer that has to write meaningful, you know, um, business-related code on those machines. And uh, you have the problem of choosing which vendor, which hardware, which way of handling all of that. And usually, uh, you have to deal with issues about how oh, can I actually express whatever I want to do in, on those complex systems, and what are the ergonomics of all the existing solutions. Um, so that's normally where I should have had, you know, this uh, very well-known uh, XKCD uh, web comics about standards, you know. So you have 10 standards about something and nobody is happy with that. So someone decides to make a new standards to, you know, unify everything and then you have 11 standards. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of what happened <laughs> somehow uh, with the cycle standard. Okay, or SQL standard. I, I should learn to pronounce that. It's SQL, like you know, the, the round, uh, curvy uh, things. Okay, and just to you know uh, answer this question before it came up, there is no Hammer project related to that, so it's just the SQL. Um, so SQL is what? It's a standard. It's uh, mostly propelled by uh, the uh, Kronos Group, uh, that you may know for its work on OpenCL. Uh, uh, among others, and um, it also deal with uh, stuff like Spire V and stuff like that, which are open industry standards around all these technologies about accelerators, GPUs, whatever. Uh, the idea behind SQL is the fact that we want to have something that looks like regular C++, with regular C++ idiom and construct being built in. So you can actually write C++ looking like code on some stuff. As you, as you may see, a, a lot of them. And uh, the standard being open, the implementation is well, rather free for anybody to try and do some things. And you have a bunch of actual implementation by different actors, uh, being companies or open source initiatives, uh, that targets different subset of uh, machines and systems. And uh, basically, you can write SQL code. Okay, and uh, well, you can target a bunch of Intel machines. You can target 
a whole bunch of uh, GPUs uh, style machine, including AMD and NVIDIA. You can target FPGAs, stuff like that. And so the idea is to s keep this standard as close to the language as possible. And that's why we tried to play around a bit with it uh, to see if we can, well, if we can actually understand what's going on, can, what can we do with that, the basics of the uh, idea, the vision behind the standards. Um, we worked with a bunch of people on some you know, actual subjects uh, well, related to high level, um, sorry, uh, high energy physics. And uh, we'll see how we can actually you know, take all of that and can we actually fit that into an actual library with you know, a decent API or whatnot and can we actually get something out of that. So, SQL, open standards for uh, heterogeneous, um, you know, um, accelerator-based computing. Okay, that's the, um, that's the goal of the old thing. It's supported by a bunch of companies. Uh, the one version we used is the Intel one, uh, which is called One API. That gathers a lot of things. Uh, a bunch of them are very uh, Intel specific. You have a bunch of libraries, uh, like the old MQL uh, stuff for data analytics. So you, you got TBB all bunched in together. And everything is associated to a new version of the Intel compiler, which is called uh, ICPX. Uh, this slide is actually a bit old now. Um, which is actually, well, it's a new version of the Intel compiler, which is based on NLVM. And that also gives us access to these uh, SQL supports. You can actually try it. I will give you some information. But if you are more into you know, like using non-proprietary software for building your own, um, Clang, starting uh, Clang 15, I guess, also supports SQL. So you can try it with, with Clang. Uh, or you can try one of the other um, you know, uh, version of that. You can try IPSQL also, which is open source, which is based on OpenMP somehow. Uh, so you have a lot of, you know, um, how to say that, a variation of SQL implementation uh, laying around. Um, the Intel one is great because now they have this, you know, push for more open source software, and you can basically download the Docker with everything inside, and it just works. So you, it's rather easy to um, to do this. So that's the version we used just for disclosure. So whatever result we are going to present is based on this version of SQL. OK, so what's, uh, what's the big thing? So how how is it this thing is working? So um, the SQL programming model, in some way, if you are familiar with um, programming model for GPUs like CUDA or stuff like that, has some um, similarities with this. We will see that we will have this notion of you know um, active threads over multi cores that do stuff into blocks and so and so on and so forth. The one main the one main difference is that a lot of things in SQL are actually very explicit in terms of uh, construction, in terms of selections. So it may look a bit more like you know verbose at the first time, but we find out that in the end, it's actually easier to reason about what's going on and to build stuff around that, so that we will try to, to see that. Well, it supports a bunch of uh, functions and objects to find a device, uh, get an action queue on that, so which is the, the way we will have to pass computation to the device. Uh, there is a bunch of ways to express different parallel operations, and different ways to handle memories, uh, either manually or using the buffer and accessors um, abstraction that will be, as we will see, far more C++ like that uh, than what we have in other systems. And we have a way to build task graph with uh, an implicit or explicit handling of dependencies between operations. So we have all of that playing around, and we will try to see how everything works. Again, if you want to try this, there's a bunch of links you can get later if you want to try that. So let's go and see what's going on. So the first thing we have to do uh, when we write a SQL program is to connect to a device. This is done through the queue object, which represents um, the medium of communication between your program on the host machine, which is uh, usually your main, your main machine, your main CPU, to the whatever device you are choosing to. And the queue will transfer in, um, operations data to the device, and it can also retrieve information from the device 
so you can know what you are currently doing, uh, what kind of um, specificities your device can support, because you can actually choose whatever you want as a device, and this will be the main, uh, how to say that, the main uh, intermediaries uh, between uh, the CPU code and the accelerator codes. So you can just build the queue, and by default, we get whatever the implementation decided to give you. Uh, it could be the best device you can find, like uh, if you have an accelerator, it will give it to you, and if not, you will access to your CPU, or it can be always the CPU, it's, it's implementation defined. But uh, we can, as we say that, we can get the device back from the queue and ask him some information. So we can say, well, what's your name? What's your, uh, what's your version number? How many parallelism level do you have? Whatever. And of course, we can also uh, select a device based on some, uh, well, properties. So you can, you have a bunch of pre-existing selectors that say you can use to say, okay, I want my, I want a GPU, I want a CPU, I want uh, any accelerator. So if I have any, uh, multiple of that, you can also select device by choosing aspects. So give me whatever you have but I want something which is debuggable and support 16-bit uh, floating points, for example. And you can also write your own logic that say, okay, this is a device I have, and uh, if it has this or that properties, I will rank it higher than if it only has that or that one. And depending on where you run your code, it will fetch the device information, rank them, and will give you the best one depending on your logic. So you can embed a lot of, how to say that, um, tricks into the selection process because, for example, uh, you can actually say, oh, you know what, uh, if my, um, I, I'm building a queue for doing some operation on a bunch of data in the matrices or something, and if I have the size of my matrix, I have the uh, number of operations I want to do, I can fetch a device, uh, fetch the information about, I don't know, like its memory bandwidth or something, and if it fits my execution model, then I will take it, and if not, I will just take the CPU, and you can just run your code, and it will be automatically be placed on the correct places, uh, depending on what you want to choose. So it's very flexible. So, but the thing we have to, to see there is that it's explicit. We start by building a queue. Okay, but the cool thing is that you can have multiple queues. You can have multiple devices at the same time, and you can feed a device with different queues. Okay, and uh, every action, on any number of devices, on any number of queues are all asynchronous as long as they are uh, sent to different queues. So you can actually build a complex system where you will be pumping data into a queue while you pump operation on the other one. You can synchronize those so you can build a classical you know, pipeline structure so you can send the data while you are computing and getting some back. And everything will be working uh, basically without doing anything else but that because everything in SQL is asynchronous by default. That's also something we need to care about because obviously at some point we will need to do some synchronization or to do some um, precise code to ensure the cooperation of the different actions and queues and whatnot. So let's, let's see how we can actually start those parallel operations. So uh, this is a queue thing, okay. Uh, so we have a string which is badly encoded, of course. Uh, <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> um, so this is the most basic things we, we can do, okay? So that's using uh, something which is called the unified memory model, in which we will be just allocating memory in a place where both the CPU and the device can actually read and write inside it. It's very crude, it's not very performant in some cases, but it helps us just, you know, make something works. And from that, we can you know, um, uh, refine and optimize later. So this is just so that it fits in the slide, basically. Okay. So what do we do there? So we have this string over there. We have this malloc shared things that let you allocate a bunch of data uh, in this shared memory block. If you are familiar with CUDA terminology, okay, uh, this is not the same shared memory as in CUDA. That's something which is across the CPU, uh, the host, and the device. It's not the shared memory inside the device. So we can just mem copy the data inside that, and it will trigger uh, some uh, data transfer at some point. Uh, and then we can ask the queue uh, to start some operation, 
And we know it's parallel operation because it's like in, in the name, actually. That's a parallel four. It takes a number of repetitions. And it takes a regular lambda as, as a kernel function. So there is no, you know, like underscore, underscore, global, kernel, syntax, whatever. It's a regular lambda. And actually, it can be any regular callable objects. So you can have a function objects somewhere. You can have regular uh, non-template uh, non function if you want. As long as it's a callable as per C++ definition, it's OK. So there, what do we do? We take the uh, input, uh, which is the index on which the kernel is currently replicated. And we do something at this place. We just subtract one from, this, uh, from the current characters. And then we wait. We wait. So we wait on the completion in parallel for. Okay, so we can do it this way. We could do it like waiting on the queue, or we could have um, stored the event object that the parallel for returns and wait for it later. Okay. Events in SQL, it's a bit like a poor man's uh, promise future things. Okay, so you can just you know move the things around. And when that's done, as the memory is shared, somehow we got the result there. Uh, directly, and we can uh, send it back to the system afterwards. So that's the basic things. Okay, it works, but it's not very, you know, neither efficient, neither very C++ issue. You know, like uh, malloc free things. We don't like. We don't do that anymore. Well, we shouldn't be doing that anymore. You probably should not, because <laughs> I don't. Uh, <laughs> and so yeah, that, that's the basic thing. We will see that we have better uh, a better system for that. Now, the, the interesting thing is that the uh, malloc shared things do this um, allocation on this special memory uh, block, which is a bit kind to the pine memory in CUDA. So we do the mem copy things. It's DM'd into the, uh, into the device. And whenever it's done, because it could take some time over there, and we run that, we are basically waiting implicitly on the result copy to be done. We start the, um, the kernels on every as the um, computing element we do, we do the results, the wait, wait for the finishing, and we know that the result is back, and we get the thing. That's just that. But as I say, we could actually have done something else there, wait for later, and so on and so forth. So now, um, let's do that in a bit of a better way. Because at this point, what we did was just allocating a bunch of data and call it a day. What we can do is that we can use buffer and accesses. Buffers act as a view-like array stuff, okay, that maps an existing part of memory on the host, okay, and uh, that can be later accessed on the device using an accessor. So this basically says, this is a piece of memory I care about. Is it, it, it's that big, okay. Then I can use this submit things, which is a bit more potent than just calling parallel for. It takes a handler reference, which is some kind of uh, medium between the CPU code and the device code. And what we do is that we say, oh, you know what? On this uh, device handler, I want to have an accessor that will look into the data buffer. And this will create a relationship between the data on the host and the device. And then I can use the accessor directly as an array-like you know, object to access the data through the buffer. So it looks like exactly like what we did before, but with extra steps and non-trivial abstraction for no reasons. But we will see that it's actually important. And what we can do later is we can have an host accessor, which is an accessor on the host machine, that look up and reads the data back for us to get into our, um, our on, on the CPU and display them. And we see that we have this uh, read-only thing there which is an access modifiers, we can have on accessors. And that's very important because using this accessor and the order in which the accessor inside a submit call are constructed, the compiler will be able to infer the task graph dependencies between all the buffers and the when the point where you are using them. Okay. So this is a way to do it. And uh, it's a bit better than before because we just use this buffer thing on top of the, of the data for that. We don't have this malloc shared and we don't have the free. It's a, bo a bit more, you know, uh, error to I like. Okay. And we can actually do even better 
Because if we, let's zoom on that a bit, so the same thing, okay, but look at what we do there. We build the buffer into a scope, and when the buffer is destroyed, okay, whatever data it's tied to, which is all, all on, already on the device and not on the, on the host yet, will be transferred automatically. So we can get rid of this strange host accessor notation just by scoping our buffer, doing operation on them, wait for them to be destroyed. The destructor gives the data back onto the host machine and we get our results. Okay. So we could actually use these buffer accessor things as, well, as the, an actual era 2 i enabled uh, transfer system, which is very interesting because we could actually put that into a function. Okay, we start building the buffer, we do whatever we need on the device, and we go out of the functions, and we know that whatever the data we are computing on the device in the function is back on the CPU when we go out of it. Okay, so that's one way to do this. We, can, or we could also have a storage for buffer elsewhere, so we can keep the data in the GPU up to the point we need them later on. Okay, fine, 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 fine. Now, uh, yeah, we send stuff on, on the GPU or on the accelerator. Uh, we did very simple computation for now. What, that, what if we want to actually extract some amount of fileism from that? So we have uh, another model which is very close to what we are used to have on other GPU-like systems, which is this uh, block things that we call work groups there. And so when you work on some amount of data, okay, uh, you can actually slice them into work group. And the work group is a bunch of work items. Okay, It can be one, two, or three dimensionals. And inside this work group, you have subgroup, which is one dimensional uh, bunch of work items. This is these green things over there, in which you can actually access every work item the way you want. And we have a way to either just work with work group and work items, or we can work with the your hierarchy of work group group and work item as we need to express more or less nested parallelisms. And by doing that, it will also map on the actual hardware on the different level of parallelism you have access. So if you have a GPU, you probably go onto the multiprocessors and into the internal threads. But if you have, for example, a CPU, because you can access CPU system with SQL, uh, the work group will probably be threads like in, in CPU threads, and the subgroup will probably be mapped onto SIMD registers or stuff like that, or multiple SIMD registers. And by doing these hierarchical parallelisms, we can actually exploit um, different level of um, performance you know, um, sources. So uh, let's write a small uh, algorithm. Right? Let's do a for all thing, which is basically a for each. Uh, you take a function. Okay, uh, you take a vector and you want to process that this function on on the device. So what do we do? Well, uh, when we build the queue, we map the data from the vector inside the buffer. Okay, and look that in this case I don't even have to specify the size of the buffer because buffer know what the range is and it knows how to get to the size of the range in C plus plus twenty directly. So it just knows it's a, that it's a vector or it's a range or it has a, a data, it has a size, and it works with that directly without us doing anything. What do we do next? Well, we have an accessor on, on this buffer. We compute the size and we run this parallel for this time with a ND range that will tell us that we want to work on block on 64 blocks of eight work items. So this is the block size and the work item size. And what we have, we have these item things instead of an auto there. Uh, we see that we have this one over there, which is the number of dimension we work with. And we do the classical, oh well, if my uh, index of my work item is in the zone of my data, I just call the function over, uh, over the data. And I'm taking a function from outside that I wrote as a lambda on the CPU directly. I mean, this is a regular lambda. And it gets transferred over there get shipped to the, to the GPU or whatever without us having to do anything else. So it's a single source, single pass. We don't have to think about, oh, it has to be a device function, it has to be whatever. It's a lambda, just works. 
Okay. So uh, this is a very basic thing. We can probably do that better, and some people did. Okay. Uh, if you want to have a, a look at that, we can have a look at the parallel STL implementation from Kronos, which is basically uh, a SQL-based uh, um, execution policy implementation. We have a bunch of algorithms on GPU using this. And it's, it just works this way. Okay? It just, you just take a function, you, you, you run your parallel for, you submit the things, you capture the uh, func there uh, by a reference over there, and then again there, and it just works. Just works. Don't have to think about that. And uh, despite the fact that it's very uh, explicit, oh, you have to get the queue, you have to get to, to the handler, you have to submit the thing, you have to wrap stuff into a buffer, in the end, it just, I mean, it just looks like regular C++. And you can just do whatever you want, okay? And one thing, what we'll be having a look at la later, is that what if I push that to a point where I have a very complex C++20 library and I just do that somewhere? And it just, it just works, okay? That's, in terms of languages, that's the main interesting point, okay? So, what do we do with that? Well, we do some science. Or we try. I mean, so, someone with a science degree do science and we do the computation, but that's, that's the deal of it, okay, right? So you may know about the uh, LHC, the Large Hadron Colliders. Uh, they take protons and they smash them together because that's how physics is done right now. Uh, and <laughs> in these collisions, uh, we expect that the, uh, this high energy collision will just spring out new particles or new uh, phenomena that we don't know about. All we know about and we want to be sure that it works the way we think it works. And uh, the Atlas experiment is basically a bunch of detectors, uh, different kind, calorimeters, um, electromagnetic detectors, a lot of things, okay, uh, that detects, um, how to say that, not particles themselves, but hints that somewhere, somehow, a particle was there at some point. And by analyzing those traces, those uh, measurements in space and time, we can guess what kind of particle was there. Because if your particle is heavier than what you think, it has a different you know, parabola-like trajectory. If it just goes straight, you know that it's not magnetic, stuff like that, okay, physics. Um, and there is a, a, a software which is called the ACTS software, uh, which is obviously as all uh, serious software as a recursive acronym, of course. So ACTS is the ACTS Common Tracking Software. Uh, it's a bunch of algorithms of detection, so we pre-process the uh, result of the raw detector's data, right? And we try to find traces of particles. So there is a bunch of um, detection, um, reconstruction and tracking of particles based on different uh, algorithms. So some people do machine learning, some people do old school uh, stuff like, you know, Kalman filters, stuff like that. So we can group a measurement somehow in, the, uh, in, in some energy level. And when we have that, we can say, oh yeah, you know, it looks like we go this way, you know. And by aggregating those small ins uh, in, a, in, a, in a process called seeding, okay, these blue things, as soon as we have something that looks like, yeah, it, it kind of looks like a trajectory, okay, we can extrapolate it and try to find, you know, um, where actual detection fits and do some statistics and so we know that it's actually whatever uh, we were looking for, okay. And uh, there is a lot of such traces in, in a single experiment. It's multiple hundreds of gigabytes per second in every collision they do. So they have a huge amount of data to process, so they want to do that fast. So they try to use whatever they can to accelerate those computations. So GPUs, FPGAs, whatever, okay, it has to be fast. So what do they do? Well. They implemented a bunch of ACTS um, uh, core algorithms using different techniques um, on NVIDIA machine, using CUDA, using SQL, and basically uh, we have a rather huge speed up compared to the um, basic CPU versions. And it quite performs okay if we compare to more manual uh, proper CUDA codes. So all in all it was some kind of a good experiment because we we were about to see that, um, yeah, it works, and it works as much as good as any other uh, GPU targeting things. 
So if we do serious stuff, it works. Okay. So what about we do less serious stuff, okay, and more C++ stuff? Um, yeah, because you know, some point. Um, yeah, we work on some. Oh, sorry, some bunch of library. Uh, one of them is Kiwaku, which is the, um, a C++ 20 storage library of multidimensional data. And uh, the question is, why doing this? Because you know, MD span and stuff. Okay. Uh, well, it's not MD span for different reasons. Uh, first, because we wanted to have a single, you know, uh, places where we have the, both the non-owning non -own, non and owning uh, data structures, and we wanted to play around and try to, you know, uh, play around with API, with the way we want to define algorithm, with the way we want to define um, interfaces for people to specify what they want into their containers. So we want to do that. And uh, as multiple, multiple dimension data processing is complicated for many reasons, we also provide different uh, algorithms and execution contexts that let you go on different hardware without doing the wrong thing with your data. We are not in the business of computing linear algebra stuff. We are not Eigen. We don't do expression templates, whatever. We are just storing the data in a meaningful way, in a controllable and configurable way, and so we also provide ways to process the data in a current way. So we want to do use C++ 20 as much as we can, which implies a bunch of template metaprogramming, a bunch of concepts, a bunch of a lot of things like that. And uh, we use something that looks like execution policy. It's the same idea, but it's done in a different way because we wanted our context, execution context, to be something that some people can actually uh, define themselves, which is not easy with execution policies. And to do so, we are based on something called algorithmic parallel skeletons that give you a bunch of simple functions. And as soon as you have that, you, can, you are good to go and we can use them into our algorithms. So let's have a look. Uh, how does it work? So we have views. Obviously, that's the easiest thing to do. And the first thing we are going to look is what the heck is this definition of V, OK? So we have this um, named parameters-based interface where you can just say, OK, this is my size, this is my data sources, this is my option of storage and whatnot. And uh, you don't have to think about the order uh, which parameter is a template or not. We just infer everything from the uh, definition of the, of the object in a complex uh, deduction guide. But you just make a view with whatever stuff with that. So this is a view of some size over the data I have there, and I can pass them through to these square each things. And uh, as the type of the view is very complicated, because we need to turn that into something that fits and skip all the information, it's not easy to take one as a parameter, so we have also parametric concepts where you can say, oh yeah, I want a view, or I want a view with some dimensions, or with some base type, or both, in any order you want, or any other uh, test, uh, compile time testable properties. So usually we do this, we have a concept of view, and we can say, okay, give me whatever of view which is one dimensional and floating points, and I can do something like this. Uh, one, what, why 1D and not exactly the size? Because you can have, a, this size is uh, dynamic, we can have static size, we can have hybrid static compile time, runtime size. So we just say, oh, I have just one, one dimension. And you can just work on it like, you know, it's an array, so you, you can just, you know, iterate with using index. But of course, you don't really want to do that. So uh, you can actually uh, have algorithm on that. And uh, this version is a bit different, so we build a table, which is the owning version of view. So we allocate some memory there, and we copy whatever is in the source thing. Uh, and we have this parent thing that lets you build a sub-range from uh, a sub-range descriptor. So if you ever worked with uh, MATLAB or stuff like that, it's basically based on this notion of I want to go to there from there. It's also a bit like NumPy. So this gives us a view. So that's the view between the, the second element and the one up before the end. And uh, well, I can transform this view, okay? And uh, if you look at what we do, that we have the function first, okay? Uh, this is the output, and this is the, the input. And the input are actually viadics. 
So we have a valid amount of input at the end, so we don't have to rely on having an implementation on Z of zip or whatever, which is not natural for a lot of people. And then we can print the table, and we are done. So we have a bunch of algorithms. We can also do more complex slicing. Okay, this is a 2D view of some data. And I make two sub view. Oh, right. That's the second one should be a Z. Sorry, that, that's a Z. That's what I get for not reviewing my code before. Uh, we have these slice things, which is a bit more complex stuff, where you can pass information about from where to where, or how many elements you want, how many elements you want to jump through. And we have these underscore things that basically means you take everything along this dimension. So we basically take a view of the data, and we make two subviews, which are the two half of them, okay, along the outer dimension. We make a table which has the same size as W, and we transform uh, W and Z, uh, and store them the result into T, and we can return T, and everything is basically just working like that. And if you want to go further, all our algorithm is able to take a context, so we have a basic CPU context, which is regular computation, or you can have cycle context, and uh, which is basically buildable like a queue, like a SQL queue. So there I'm asking for having a GPU. And this is the lambda I want to walk over my table and my view and be done. Okay. So that's basically what we are, want to have as an API. And the question is, how far can we go in terms of performances? Well, um, that's the result of a complex computation. Think like uh, STD pow of arctangent of x divided by cosinus of whatever, a huge compute uh, compute-bound uh, computation, right? Um, so the great thing is the time um, on, on the CPU context, so the basic things. And the second one is the SQL uh, timing using uh, the CPU as a target, okay? So this is a huge uh, 24 cores or 16 cores, I don't remember, 16 cores, hyper-threaded uh, IMD cores, uh, it's double. So we expect to get something around two times 16 as a speed up, okay, two from the CMD level and 16 from the cores. And the best speed up we have is like 29 over 32, which is quite okay. Okay, and now we can take the same, the same code and we just change, uh, I mean, we just change the way we uh, initialize the selector for the SQL context and we can go over some NVIDIA things. Okay, and then again, we got these things. Speed up is a bit less because the, 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 the GPU is a bit less interesting than the CPU, but that's another discussion. But we got some performance out of our code. And uh, the, the, the thing that we want to achieve with that is to be able to, if we go back a bit, um, let's just provide proper implementation for all these algorithms and a bunch more, uh, especially um, being able to work on subtiles, working on complex stencils, and map that onto the proper uh, device code each time. And by using this uh, simple implementation of the context that we just have to have a map, a reduce, and a scan base uh, operation, then we can rebuild all the algorithm from that. Uh, we can quickly have a bunch of, uh, of first running. And for more complex algorithm that doesn't fit this simple model, think about sort or uh, search, stuff like that. Uh, we have a way to specialize um, algorithms based on, a, on an actual concrete type of a context, and so we can write the proper things down. So it was a cool, uh, a cool experiment. Um, the non-cycle version of the library was quite already advanced when we started doing that, and uh, the SQL um, implementation took us like what? two weeks, something like that, of just finding the correct you know, uh, way of doing the things, wrapping the, uh, um, the elements in the correct way. So it was quite a nice experience because we had this existing C++20 code base. Uh, we came back with SQL, just shoved the thing where they should go, and it was just working. So that's something which were actually a good, you know, um, positive return on that. Okay, so uh, before concluding, um, I want to say that there is a lot of things going on into the SQL API. Uh, there is an extensive document on the Kronos websites that give you all the information about how it's supposed to be working, okay? And usually, okay, I, I should have make a rehearsal of that because 10 bucks I will pick something and it won't work. Uh, where is it? Section, whatever. Yeah, 
got some pretty extensive documentation, and even sometimes you got some decent, yeah, not this one, of course, got some decent examples, or maybe for the reduction, yeah. You got some decent examples some places. Um, it's, uh, it's updated quite frequently whenever something changes. Uh, you have an extensive um, list of stuff that changed from the version that was not C++20 based. They offer information about how to um, simplify old SQL into new SQL and stuff like that. It's a very useful uh, document. It's pretty, pretty much interesting to write. And for the people that do, what is it? Um, they want to go further than that. They also explain oh, you have a special hardware and you want to support SQL, this is the thing you have to write uh, so we can actually support your whatever into uh, SQL directly. So it's a very uh, open-ended thing. Uh, it's very interesting to, to have a look at that if you are into this. So let's conclude on that. So um, moving forward, well, if you want to use accelerators or whatnot, uh, you have to have a tool for doing this because uh, you are not going to be able to find people that are able to think about your Business, -like, business side algorithms, and then know how to work on all those machines. So you have to have tools. Uh, and having uh, standards like SQL, which is cross vendor, cross machine, is actually a, a step into the right direction. So you can quote me on that. That's my uh, personal opinion on that. Uh, it's easy to use. Uh, it's very simple to deploy. Um, so I cannot do anything else but telling you to try it if you want to go into that. Um, it's C++ 20 compatible. Uh, it knows what the range is. Uh, it knows how to handle stuff like you know tuples. It has a very extensive uh, way to detect um, uh, trivial types, regular types, and you know how to handle all of that. It's concept compatible, so it's actually very interesting. Um, it's also cool to give feedback back to Chronos. They are pretty open about that, so you can actually. Try the things, report bugs, and try to get things uh, sorted. And I would just want to make a special thanks to uh, Sylvain Jo, which is actually my PhD student that work on that, and which is responsible for all the uh, graphs and the explanation about the uh, Atlas experiment that we uh, worked on with uh, Adrien Grasson and David Chamon from EGC Labs that are also working on this project. So um, thank you very much, and uh, see you next time. And, and in, a, in, a, in a quite surprising turn of event, I still have time for questions this time, so. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Come on. Uh, yeah, I, I have a few, so like I can alternate with other people, let's go. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, first of all, like I didn't, you said, Oh, okay, it's going to target this device, it's going to target that device, right? And depending on what's available and stuff, when is the compilation happening? Um, of, the, of the code? Of the SQL code for oh, the yeah. device. Uh, so you actually have the choice. Uh, basically, uh, the, 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 uh, the main way of doing that is all compiled um, ahead of time in something that looks like a lot like PTX for uh, CUDA, which is uh, some kind of an abstract pre-compiled stuff that at runtime we get adapted to whatever happens okay, at the very beginning. Now, uh, you could also, if you, um, if you use a, a preset selector, like if you, if you say, oh, I, I build my queue with a CPU selector, or I build my queue for a GPU selector, that's something the compiler detects and we just compile for the correct, so for the correct, um, sorry, the correct device ahead of time. Now, so you have also a way to ask for a just-in-time compilation. So when the application starts, whatever your kernel was are going to be compiled. So you actually have two choices. And the compiler on its side tries to infer from whatever you wrote on the queue definition, whatever it should be trying to compile for. And uh, this compilation can be done either when you compile or it can be done just at the beginning of the application. You, you actually have the choice on that. So I can do all ahead of time, all, yeah. in, all just in time, yeah. or I can do partial compilation. Uh, that's a good question. I, I, I think the partial compilation, uh, it was working at some point. <laughs> I, I mean, okay, okay, let me rephrase that. <laughs> oh God, and I'm, and I'm actually, uh, you know, recorded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Intel people, you know, just forget that. Uh, it was supported at some point. Uh, and you still find 
trace of that into the documentation. Now, I'll be very frank with you. Uh, we usually just you know, do whatever the basic things do. So we are probably just using the ahead of time things. Um, I'm not sure the hybrid thing is still supported, but I have to go back on you on that because I don't want to say something stupid. But we, we have this opportunity to change that I know. The hybrid things was working for a while uh, when SQL was basically trying to just ride over uh, OpenCL and all the pre-existing um, implementation. I probably have to check if it's still the case. Thank you. Hello. I have some basic questions just about the selecting uh, uh, the requirements on, uh, on on your yes, where the queue should the selector. Yeah, you can uh, put there as many conditions as you can. Yep. And it will choose the best one. And yes. can you pass their condition that you want a different device than the other queue has? Yes. So what you can do is you can select. So you have this, which is, this is basically an enum, okay? This one, the CPU selector, GPU selector, accelerator selector. It's an enum, it's the basic things to do, and we just pick one. Then you can uh, use what, they what we call aspects, which is a list of stuff you want on your device, or stuff you don't want on your device. You have a, a allow, deny list system. So you can actually uh, say, oh, I want this and that, but not that and that, and the, the system will try to find you something. But if it doesn't find anything that works, it would just say, I didn't find anything, I'm just quitting. And then you can pass an arbitrary function that takes a device as a parameters and return an integers. And what it does with that is that you can test for uh, information about the device or whatever you want next to that because you can just construct this function or object function the way you want, or you can pass additional information. And what you do is that you say, OK, this device, uh, I can ask for information about it, and I can give it a score, and you will pick the highest score possible. And you have the, ch the choice to say, if I return zero, uh, just pick one, because that means I, I didn't find anything fancy, so just make a choice. Or you can return minus one, which gives you the say, OK, if you didn't succeed into finding this log something with this logic, I want you to fail. So instead of just saying I want this one or that one based on information, you can actually rank um, uh, properties of the device, and the ranking will be uh, used by the system by, okay, this is all the device I have, I will rank all of them, and I will pick the best ranked. Or I will pick nothing, or I will just fail. So you have, uh, you have a bunch of, how to say that, um, flexibility on that. Uh, considering that, for example, these get info things it basically has like, I don't know, like 20, 30 something information you can grab from the device. So ranging from the kind of memory it supports, the kind of operation it supports, is it debuggable, is it emulated or whatever. I mean, you can get a very fine grain selection process or ranking process, and usually it's enough. And you have this opportunity to say, if I don't find anything, I can go back and, you know, give you a default. Oper uh, systems. So you can basically write whatever. So in the beginning you had this slide that showed the bunch of implementations that uh, are available. So I'm wondering if there, if I'm writing an open source library, is there some kind of fallback implementation if a user of my library doesn't use one of these compilers? That will just always. Are you? You can. You can use the. Sorry. You can use the Clang cycle implementation. Yeah, but say someone is using Visual Studio, and they don't have it. <laughs> is there like a library implementation that will uh, just always uh, schedule and everything on the CPU and if yeah, you use yeah. another selector? Yeah. So selector? that's probably you probably want to target tree cycle, which was the uh, old version, the oldest version of all of that, and it has a default mode where you just do CPU things. No, I'm thinking more along along lines of I'm making an open source library. Yes. I want my users to be able to use whatever compiler they are using. Yes. And so they will compile my open source library themselves and they will use probably Visual Studio and I had to have no control over that. Is there a f like a s Oh, okay. Okay. L let's say you do that. You you target Visual Studio and you want people to be able to use your things that you see call then uh, you should tell them to use the TreeCycle library version, which is basically SQL as a library, 
without anything uh, compiler based. So it's just the, the most regular, you know, uh, no special things you can have. And so you, they just, you can just say, oh, if you are on these things and you don't have any of this fancy shit, uh, you can use that. You can use just tricycle. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> Again? Um, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Joel, um, I know you're very familiar with uh, CPU CMD stuff. And the question is, so this seems to, from what we're talking about, this seems to be a lot GPU-based. So how close do you think you can get with SQL to the handwritten CIS code that targets uh, CPU and CMD and threads? Mm, okay. Um, so for the CPU supports, um, on the threading front, uh, it's basically using, uh, it's usually used stuff like either OpenMP or TBB in the back. So the threading support is pretty good. Uh, for SIMD, depending on the uh, backend, so I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience, so I may be wrong, so take that with a piece of pint of salt. Uh, People usually uh, either rely on Pragma CMD from OpenMP, or they try to uh, reuse internally the uh, auto vectorization process of the compiler. So that basically means that the SIMD quality is depending on what kind of um, system they use for that. So I guess basically that um, if you compile using, say, uh, the Intel versions, uh, you will get results that will get pretty close to whatever the auto vectorizer from Intel is doing. Uh, if you use any other one, probably Clang. Clang is probably re uh, relying on its own auto vectorizer on, or on uh, OpenMD CMD. And in all cases, that means that if you have a piece of code that is not, um, how to say that, uh, that amenable to being vectorized because it used some, you know, like some CMAT functions or it uses a, a complicated memory access pattern that the auto vectorizer doesn't know about, it's probably subpar uh, compared to what you can do by end. Uh, now, uh, what could be done, but my days are quite full already, it should be possible to make a, a platform backend for SQL that actually use an actual proper vectorization system. Uh, I didn't look into that, but it's probably feasible. Um, but then you will have to uh, be careful because you cannot, you, you have a lot of information in this platform backend thing that is probably too runtimey uh, if you want to have a perfect, you know, CMD code generation. So it's usually as good as whatever the auto vectorizer of the compiler is, which means that if you do, how to say that, um, regular computation, I don't know if it's a thing, you know, like you are not going to uh, to do very fancy, complicated uh, math things, or uh, you have very complicated run uh, runtime based tensile size or whatnot, it would probably be pretty good. Uh, I mean, as, as much as good as you could have with the auto vectorizer. But it's probably some notch below what you can be doing with manual CMD if you want to, you know, write everything yourself and, and do all these uh, complex things uh, all by yourselves. It's probably in between. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, so you had these questions with a secret string. What's the decoded version? Oh, uh, I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> I think it's something like Hello World from SQL or something like that. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, it's probably Hello World. This is op uh, this is SQL from one API or something like that. Uh, the funny thing is that that's actually an uh, that's actually an Intel example, and they didn't check that. I mean, I mean, the, the end of the uh, the end of the secret is actually. Uh, okay. <laughs> So well, now yeah, it's a hello world thing. I mean, it, we, it's not very, very funny. And we have another question from the yep. audience. So, what implementation do you recommend to get started with Cycle? And can you use actually Clang directly? Uh, normally, Clang just walk out of the box, uh, as long as you have like some recent versions. Uh, we used to use the uh, Clang trunk that it's on Compiler Explorer to do our early exploration. If you don't want to, you know, 
go into, oh, I need to install complex stuff on my machine, or I can't install, whatever. Uh, just, just give a try to the one API Docker. It's, I mean, it's a bit big. It's like 10 gigabytes, something like that. But you have the YOL, uh, you have the YOL Bonanza. So you have, um, you have the compiler for SQL, you have the uh, libraries, you have the, um, what's the name of these things? Uh, it changes all the time. Uh, Vtune slash uh, Parallel Advisor slash I don't know how it's called today. Uh, but you see this kind of thing. So uh, it's, it's rather trivial, you can just docker it up and it just works. Um, so depending on what you want to have as an experience, you go either with the client version or with that. And if you want to go a bit further than that and you need stuff like you need to support uh, CUDA, you, you want to target, sorry, CUDA and stuff like that, uh, then uh, you have an extensive uh, setup, ex uh, setup documentation on uh, the One API pages where you can have, you can find the exact uh, packet list for your own Linux distribution, uh, both for the compilers, the tools, and the um, the CodePlay uh, CUDA plugin if you want to support CUDA. It's rather well documented, and uh, from experience, it usually just works. So it's something which is also actually quite cool because you don't have to deal with a bunch of you know uh, trashing your display because you forgot to update your graphic driver or whatnot. Thank you again.